And where am I gonna sit? I'll sit on that. Put it wherever you want it. I should just be, yeah, I'll just slide it up like that. I had that table in my cabin over in Bend. Oh. Right. I like that. Can I sit on this then? Sure. Bring it over. You bet. Look out. Oh, there you go. Jan's footstool. What, how do you want to start out? You want to, you were going to, was this your first state fair event? No. It wasn't? No. Okay, I, th I was thinking the same I think that was here. 65. It, it was. This was 65. But yeah. I, I thought that was your first state fair event. Okay. Okay. We're on and rolling. We can start out. You want you want to start out talking about how you got. And you can cut out, you know, so whatever. Oh yeah, yeah, we're just talking. Yeah. Today I'd like to talk about doing fairs and festivals because I got into that because I was doing the stuff at the Armory, and uh, the Oregon State Fair manager uh, came to me and he said. Uh, yeah, uh, we we don't use the armory at the at the fair in that early '60s. So you got any ideas? And I said, Yeah, I'd like I'd like to put a dance in there um, uh, on Friday night. The fair wasn't even going then, and I said, I'd like to put a dance in there. Uh, the Chevelles, they were a big deal in town. There was a football game also that night in Salem, and uh, we kind of advertised it as an after football dance at the armory by the Oregon State Fair. So Howard Maple said, let's do it. So we did it. I never forget he had an assistant by the name of Jack Matlack who did all of his publicity and his advertising. And, and we got this together and they said, well, you know, it's the fair's not open. Nobody will even come. And I said, well, kids are used to coming to the Armory to go to dances. Let's see what happens. And that was in the early 60s. It was interesting because uh, I don't think any of the kids went to the football game. We had a packed house the night before the fair even opened. It was a Friday night. I don't think the fair opened on Friday in those days. And so it went very, very well. So he came back to me and said, uh, you got any other ideas? And I said, yeah. I said, um, I'd like to turn that into a teen center. It was a big deal in the early 60s. Teen centers where there was stuff for teens to do and they come to, uh, they had one at the Coliseum that was very, very successful. I said, I'd like to do one of those. And, and we knocked that around for a few years and um, Finally came up and with the idea of 1965 to do in a uh, teen center at the fair. And this this is the flyer that we used in those days. We handed these out, a lot of them. And uh, this is kind of one of the original first flyers. But uh, Sonny and Cher were there in 65, I think. Yeah, I think they were. And uh, But it, they were just one night at the teen center. And uh, then we had bands and local bands playing. And, and uh, this state opened the whole fairgrounds. Well... Uh, Meyer and Frank adopted this and they came in and they put up a teenage bedroom set, a teenage dressing room, a teenage, this whole armory was full of booths and stuff for teenagers. And it, it was pretty successful. Uh, the night we had Sonny and Cher there, though, the fair was not open. It wasn't open. And I, I never will forget that the concessionaires were in there setting up. There were so many people on the fairgrounds that they had to open early because there were people there that wanted to be fed. And so it was very, very successful. And I, I remember going down to ABC. It, that, ABC was an agency that sold acts. And Frank Rio, I says, I want to put Sonny and Cher in the Oregon State Fair. And he goes, we've never played a state fair. They don't, they don't play fairs. And I said, well, let's give it a try. So I went over to a garage in LA where Sonny and Cher were living and met Sonny and Cher, and they were dressed just like Sonny and Cher were dressed, living in a garage. They hadn't taken off yet, it was in spring. And I said, I've, I'm gonna use you for an opening act. Well, by the time we got him here, they were bigger than the opening act, so the opening act didn't wanna perform. So we just had the Sonny and Cher show. And it went very, very well. Sonny was an interesting guy to get to know. He, he was with Phil Spector, and that's how he met Cher. She was a Ronette. So he met her as a Ronette. 
they teamed up and that got put together then they moved to LA lived in this garage it was a fixed up nice garage and uh, I don't think they had any money at that time because it was before anything happened well the night that that uh, Sonny Rocher was at the Oregon State Fair they had three or four hits on the top 100 and I Got You Babe was number one so it really turned into a monster and it turned out very well well Howard Maple came over and he went why aren't you doing the rest of our entertainment I said well I, I, I don't know uh, he said well next year think about putting some shows together for the uh, grandstand now that in those days we used the horse racing grandstand after the races in other words they'd race and then we'd pull a stage out in front hook up the sound the lights and and do shows and put chairs down in front and the first year I, I can remember we brought in uh, uh, oh Chuck Berry and that was a I never never met an animal like that in my life that was interesting we also had the Pat Boone family here they were here also and that was very interesting too and they both went very well so kind of kept it up after that kind of kept doing shows at the fair and uh, when we first started it was in the grandstand and we pulled that stage out but it just the horse racing inquiries were lasting so long sometimes we couldn't even start setting up till eight o'clock so a new fair manager came along and said we got to do something different i think by that time uh, howard maple was gone and they brought in a new fair manager out of portland he was a manager of multnomah county fair and um ingberg and uh, he came down here and had a lot of did a lot of improvements to the fairs you know that's one thing i noticed about fairs is that if that a very successful fair manager and a very successful board the fair was successful but if you had a fair manager that wasn't successful meaning working with people and a board who tried to tell everybody what to do usually the fairs fair was always kind of shaky and after being on 50 to 75 fair uh, properties and doing at least that many fairs over 50 years it was all people it wasn't it wasn't the fair it was who ran the fair and how they ran the fair you know it always amazed me that people on fair boards some of them couldn't even balance their own checkbooks but they put up on these fair boards because they were privileged or knew somebody to run these fairs and they they couldn't they didn't understand budgets they 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 always overspend their budget because the government would cover us you know that was their saying the government will cover us and so i saw a lot of that over the years of very successful fairs and ones that aren't successful and there's a reason you just can't put an elephant in the trainer in charge of flying an airplane and sometimes you saw a lot of that happen is that those people had those jobs because they were owed that job because of how they did things so anyway it was interesting over all those years in a really interesting story is I was doing a fair in Washington and I walked in one day and the board was sitting there and the manager was sitting there and he said I want this act I said let me do some research so the next meeting I come back and said they're not playing their records here in this in this area they're not selling any records in this area and the record company is not spending any money on promoting her or the records it'll bomb he said you don't understand my wife wants that artist here I says is that what you want that's what I want okay so we brought that artist in and it bombed so the next fair board meeting I went to that was on the agenda I was like why did that act bomb I said read the minutes wasn't my choice it was you and the board's choice they fired me they said you're fired and I said great so I got up and left well within two years I was back doing the fair again um, and you get a lot of people that do a lot of things that they want to do they don't think about the fair person who's come to the fair they think about themselves and that's what really screws up a lot of boards I'm being told right now by a very reputable fair manager in California that there's probably 22 fairs that are going broke and will not be going this year at least 22 and I think if you look at the finances of fairs and you go back and you research why they're where they are you'll understand um, they are a business they haven't been treated as businesses 
They're run by government. And they have their hands tied in a lot of things. So it's going to be interesting in the next five to ten years to see what happens to a lot of these fairs. Because they're going to have to be subsidized. They are not making it on their own. But there are some that really are. There's a couple of fairs in Oregon that make a lot of money because they got good fair managers and they got good boards. The, the boards, if they have control of the fair manager and they're not business oriented, they drive the fair manager nuts and they usually quit. But if the boards are business minded, business people, and the fair manager understands budgets, they usually do pretty good. But anyway, that's kind of my personal opinion and whatever. So what we did is we moved the, we moved the entertainment from away from the front of the fairgrounds that faced east. And we moved it to the armory because we didn't have to wait for stages to move. We didn't have to worry about the weather. And, and one of the first shows that I did, it seems like this was done in the uh, armory, but it says a grandstand. This is one of the first shows that, that uh, Howard asked me to put together and we'd put it together and we sold it out twice. But the armory only seats, what, 3,400. And it, and, and it worked pretty well. And then we continued to do it in the armory, but the problem was it only seat 3,400 and we needed more seats. So we built a stage out on the west side of the grandstand and that was the new stage and they put benches in front of it and that probably seated about 10,000 people. Then we started bringing in pretty good acts, good acts, a lot of the up-to-date stuff like uh, um, Merle Haggard and uh, the Osmonds and the stuff that was really up popular at the time and up-tempo. And we packed that place. I brought in uh, the Disneyland on Parade. That was really successful. People poured in for that. Had all the Disney characters. They danced, they sang. And it was very, very popular. A lot of Johnny Cash. This area, they loved Johnny Cash. So we tried to bring him in at least every three or four years. Uh, Roy Orbison, um, just a bunch of, uh, of of people that we exposed at the armory in the f late 50s and 60s, so people who knew who they were. And of course it was free. When we built that stage out on the west side of the grandstand, it was free. You, you got in, if you paid admission to get in the fair, you got in the show, it's free. But it turned out it wasn't enough. And I've got, we got pictures showing out the overflowing of that area into the midways and into the carnival areas. I remember when we had the Oak Ridge Boys, I, Elvira was number one. And when they sang Elvira, everybody on the fairgrounds sang Elvira. You could hear it come from the carnival, from the barns, everywhere, because everybody knew who Elvira was. And so there, that, we moved it out there then. Um, I went to, went to Japan and discovered an auditorium over there they said was universal. So when I went over there, uh, when the city sent a bunch of us over there, they sent me over there with 20 kids. We put a uh, singing group together and we went over there and we spent a week and we did like um, 12 concerts in Japan playing colleges, high schools, auditoriums. And that's where the concept for this auditorium came. I took a bunch of pictures, came back, Dwight Butt was there, showed them to him. He brought the architects in, and that's where this thing came from. It was an amphitheater in Japan. The difference is they didn't put a roof on it, and they, and they had a roof on it over there. They, bu they built the structures to put a roof on They're out there, but they didn't put a roof on it. And what hurt us there was the sound would go down the tracks and all the people and the residential areas could hear it, and so we had to turn it down, turn it up. So the fine was put on at $10,000. If you got so many phone calls and the neighbors, and they were going to fine you $10,000. And I had one group that came in, and they turned it up, and they said, we're not turning it down, so we'll fine you ten grand. The, the city fined them ten grand. The group wrote the check for ten grand and gave it to the city, saying, we're not turning it down. Uh, the pro problem is it's next to a railroad track. Sound travels. Sound, sound is like smoke. It blows if there's wind. It blew right down that, right down that the railroad track, and Baker Street. Those people could hear like they were sitting in the front row of the, of the uh, auditorium. So there were a lot of complaints about that also. 
But that's how that that auditorium got built, was copying one after the one in Japan that I went to and saw, uh, a little town called Kawagoi. And that was a fun trip. Uh, a bunch of us went over from Salem, and it was a sister city, and it, that was good. The kids had a great time. Had problem with one kid, just one kid, of all those kids. And I said, what are your folks doing? He says, my dad's a preacher. I went, okay. So anyway, uh, it went well. That the whole trip went well. But but that's how I got started in the fair business. And then then I branched off. And and at one time when we were doing I think thirty fairs, uh, all the way up to Linden, Washington, the Canadian border, all the way down to uh, um, uh, San Diego. Did that fair. Tons of fairs in between. Um, furthest east we ever went with us was. Uh, did the Spokane Fair a number of years. Also did Boise, the Boise, Big Bear in Boise. I counted up one year and counting the number of shows that we did that one year. Now, you sell one band to a fair for a week and they do like six shows a week on that stage. We were doing over 800 shows a year if you added all the shows up. So it got to be quite a few shows going. But the fair business was a good business, met a lot of neat people. But it's like business. Good people working it, it worked. And it still is to this day. But a lot of fairs are going out of business and there's a reason why. And that's the fair business. Now, you know, it was interesting because the number one question asked to me was, what do these entertainers do before a show? Well, they're backstage talking they bring their bands, uh, they bring their wives, their kids, and they're no different than anybody else. They're, they're living day to day on those buses or flying. I mean, you get up in the morning, you go to your bus, a lot of them go to the airport, get on a plane, fly to the next town, buses are waiting. A lot of, a lot of the bands had double buses. I mean, they would shuffle them. Uh, they would shuffle the buses to one city and then, and then the other set of buses would go to the next city and then they'd shuffle to them the next day after the show. But you pretty much live on buses, hotel rooms, fairgrounds. You get the opportunity to eat a lot of good fair food. And you know what? We catered for them and a lot of them would rather eat the fair food because they were tired of eating backstage food. It was good food, but they wanted a prano pup or they wanted a hot dog or they wanted a, and, and they would ask, would you go out and get us just some fair food? I said, come on. A lot of the vendors would give it to them. They just, you know, you walk up and you were Vince Gill and, and some of those guys, they'd say, you know, I, we just want some fair food. And they, they'd give it to them because they were asking for it and, and then they'd invite them backstage. And I had one vendor from Newport one time bring over a ton of seafood because he wanted to meet uh, Smothers Brothers. He called and said, can I meet some others, brother? Can I bring a bunch of seafood over? And I said, sure. He brought over oysters and shrimp and put a big buffet backstage for him. The bands went nuts. They never had anything like that in their life. Um, there are people on the road. A lot of them are bored. Entertainers prove that money doesn't make you happy. Uh, a lot of them are not happy, but they're doing what they can do. And I saw that with a lot of groups that they were very wealthy, but a lot of them aren't very happy. And that was interesting to watch and observe because, you know, someone, if you're led to believe you're going to have all the money you want, you can have anything you want. Well, those people, most of them, it's not true. Got to know a lot of them. And, and they had a lot of problems. There were a lot of problems. And the problems had to do with money, alcohol, drugs. They just didn't know how to handle it. Interesting, when we were doing Dino, Desi, and Billy, I got a phone call from Desi's mother saying, how's he doing? I said, he's doing fine. They hired a Marine drill sergeant to go on the road with him. And he made him toe the line. Now Dino, uh, Dean Martin's kid, was a real gentleman. He was a gentleman. Uh, Billy was, his dad was the investor for Dean Martin. and. The three of them put the show together. We were going into a town one time. I had the radio on. They were playing their latest hit. They went, we didn't record that. 
and they'll expect us to play at the Coliseum tomorrow night. Well, yeah, they're playing it on the air here. We drove over to the radio station, got that record, took it back to the hotel room. They practiced, and that's how they learned that hit. I didn't ask them who did it. Didn't, you know, none of my business. But those three kids were good kids. Of course, that drill sergeant kept them squared away, too, and I know he did, but that was his job. But uh, Lucille Ball was always very nice, very cordial. I met her in L.A. She wouldn't let her kid go out on the road with anybody unless she knew him or met him. Uh, Dean's kid was a, was a gentleman, and Billy's, Billy's dad was a gentleman, too. Got some good stock hints from him. Thank you. And so, you, you know, you, you kind of get to know these people, but after you find out what their problems are, you really don't want to hang with them. Uh, they prove that money doesn't create happiness. So that was kind of what goes on backstage at a show. He always knew if a show was late, when a stagehand would walk out three minutes early and he'd get a standing ovation. That kind of told you something like, you're late, let's get going. Didn't have many late shows. The reason you don't have late shows is because you got to get them on and off so they get back out into the carnival and they eat food. Fair business is completely different. Now in Las Vegas, if you're late, they'll dock you a third of your pay because you're keeping the high rollers out of the rooms. And so there are, there are things that happen when the show is late. Never liked to have a late show, didn't have a late show unless there was an emergency or something. I can't remember over a dozen late shows in 50 years. But if there was, it was a reason for it. And, and uh, but what goes on, it's life with entertainers who are on the road who aren't having a lot of fun on the road, but they, they get a lifestyle going. They need the money. And a lot of them do it because they need the money for divorces, for cars, for, for, for. And so they stick in it and they do it. So it's, it, it's, it's another world back there. And if you knew the problems of a lot of these entertainers, you'd be shocked. So what they call a problem doesn't need to be a problem, but it is because they make it a problem. And you sit and talk to them. I've counseled a lot of female entertainers who just needed somebody to talk to because their husband doesn't talk to them, their boyfriends don't talk to them, the band won't talk to them, and they're, lon they're loners. They're just lonely. And it's interesting to watch this TV show that exposes new talent and look at them and go, your life is changed for the rest of your life. It's changed. And, and see them go on and make it, and then hear what happens to them afterwards. It's interesting. Because I have no show responsibility. I had no show experience when I got into this. I was a school teacher, bartender, teaching at the penitentiary, uh, selling um, sporting goods for Myron Frank. I had four jobs. And that was my life. I, and I lived on a farm where we milked cows and fed hogs. To get in show business was very interesting to see these different lifestyles. I always wondered, how can anybody make that much money and be unhappy? It didn't take me long to figure it out. So I'm very lucky, I've got a great family. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the fair business, how we got started on it. I'll pause there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was good. Yeah, we'll pause there. Oh, uh, can you remember though, you talk a lot about the artists being unhappy, but were there some that were obviously enjoyed it? You know what I mean? Were there some that... I can't, I can't remember anyone. Really? Yeah. Okay. It's because they're all going through trauma. How would you like to have a top entertainer chick get a phone call <clears throat> just before she going on with her husband telling her she's, he's in bed with a babysitter? Mm. Bad news. She came in and just crying. I'm not going on. Yeah. Mm. Who's that? <laughs> yeah. And I said, you know why he's doing it? He's doing it so you won't go on, so you screw up your life because he screwed his up. So you just don't go on and screw your life up.
is all screwed up and he's proven a point haven't you or you get your ass out there on the stage and you do a show and i'll personally call him when you get done and say it's the best show she's ever given mm. and uh and she did it. She went on and she gave a hell of a show. In fact, she called me a, a month later thanking me. She said, I'm divorcing him. After our talk, I understand exactly where you're coming from. And uh, huh. yeah, okay. I'm, I'm a counselor. I'm a pig farmer. It's a counselor. <laughs> Wait a minute. It's a lot of hats. Pig farmer. <laughs> pig. Far oh, okay. <laughs> so. Oh, wow. Do you remember? Do you, uh, um, um, Bob Hope, you asked me about that one. Yeah, was, uh, um, at the Sunny and Share show, um, Jim Jim Hunter, he said you had him had it arranged so he got a haircut on stage during the concert. Yeah, Remember that? yeah, um, and that's in those Sunny and Share pictures. the The barber, he wanted to be a sponsor of the show, and I said, "What well, can I do? Bring your chair, and we'll do haircuts on the stage." And when Sunny and Share go on, you got to go out. He just died. He he lived, uh, in fact, his son's here in town, but he died. He had a place up on uh, the lake, or on uh, the, uh, the lake uh, up the canyon here. Uh, and he just died, but yeah, he, uh, and I've got pictures of that too, of him on the stage. It's in the Sunny and Share file. And uh, yeah, he was, and that part of the thing was that Jim Hunter had to get his hair cut. Uh, yeah, Jim Hunter told me about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just hope his sister doesn't find out he's coming to town. She yeah. wants. She wants to kill him. I don't know if he's going to make it. He was. He was hinting to me to ask you to fly him out here. I probably do that too. Would you? Yeah. He he did he, in an email. He says, "Why don't you ask Ed?" fly me out well and and he'll email him on back i talked to ed about it and he would like to do that if he does it it looks like we're going to do it just keep us posted where you are get me a cost on a ticket but if we do it and you do come ed would do that mm -hmm. I, I, ed he he started that phase another quality ejd show uh -huh. and a lot of other stuff he started too so uh -huh. yeah he, he's talking about bringing him out here earlier than that to do to do this yeah to interview him that's what he went that's what he meant yeah. I, don't, I don't know that we need to do that or not but yeah let's get closer to it before we make that decision mm -hmm. um let's see so you, you you covered all the fair stuff oregon state fair you want to yeah i think so, yeah um how about saying just something about process of your job doing that when he goes to picking groups to come, like perform at the fair, is that significant at all? Yeah, it I is. That, yeah, it is. And and I'd like to talk a little bit about Bob Hope too. That was cool. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's on the list. Yeah. You want, you want to talk about Bob now? Sure. That was 1980. Is that when it was? Yeah. You got the poster, I think, upstairs. Okay. So, yeah. Bob Hope. What was this? Uh, the pumpkin came over to my office, the big pumpkin from Oregon State, and said, we need to do something to gel Oregon State. We got Portland, Corvallis, Eugene, and Salem. What do we do? And uh, I says, I don't know what you got in mind. He says, we need to do somebody big, 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 big. And so I called up an agent and said, is he available? And he says, absolutely. Bob Hope loves to go out and do shows. I said, we're playing an armory because we, we want to be in between Eugene, Portland, Corvallis, and we want to be in Salem. We want to kind of unite in Medford. So Frank got back to me. He said, yeah, he's open and he'd love to do it. How much is he? Well, this was 1980, you said? Huh. Anyway, I must be getting old. Anyway... So I said, how much is he? It was $40,000. So I needed to get sound and lights and rent the armory and do all that stuff. And that came to another $10,000. So I, the pumpkin, I called the old pumpkin up. He was a football coach at Oregon State, and then he was athletic director. Good guy. He was an outstanding guy. And uh, Rudd, his assistant. So we put this thing together. 
And uh, he said, well, state can't spend that kind of money. I said, well, let's, let's do a breakfast and let's sell tables for a thousand bucks. Ten, ten chairs at the table. So we ran the Salem Armory and we had enough chairs where we could, uh, tables where we could sell $10,000. And uh, we took in $50,000. So we were covered. We had our expenses covered. I didn't charge them a dime. Everybody donated their time. And uh, so we were, we were going to do Bob Hope. So everything we sold at the door for the seats up above were profit. Well, we took in $83,000. So we not only accomplished what the pumpkin wanted to do, but we made 30 grand for the Oregon State. Never saw it counted. I don't know. That's what I was told. So we accomplished it. Well, he flew in at the airport here in Salem. He got in here about 10 o'clock. Um, picked him up in the limousine, took him to the hotel. He wanted to go see the venue, so we took him out to the armory. He walked into the armory and said, you know, I've never played a garage before. I said, no, it's an armory. He says, looks like a garage to me. I said, well, and he was a great guy. He was very easy to work with. He liked to talk about his kids, his wife. Um, he liked to talk about everything. And uh, so, uh, we do the rehearsal, do the sound check. And uh, we had a judge here in town who had a jazz band. Judge uh, Parker, or, um, God, that's terrible. Uh, judge uh, Parker, Barker, Barker. And uh, so we let him open the show up. Bob loved him, Bob thought they were great. And uh, he uh, did his thing. We struck him, and and Bob went on, and he was he was funny. During the day, though, we had to get a newspaper because he had a script. He does this in every town. He just intersects, he interjects the mayor's name and city council, makes fun of everybody in the town. He says they won't be upset with it. I said, no, they'll all be here. They won't, they'll probably be complimented that you even uh, thought of them. And so he did. He put on a heck of a show. But before he went on, someone knocked at the backstage door. And uh, who is it? And the guy came in and he says, hi, Bob, how are you? And shook his hand. He went, I haven't seen you since World War II in Italy. And your name is Grabenhorse. And you drove my car over there for me when I was there. And I, and we're all going, how could he remember that? He did. And Graben Horse was there and he says, that was me. That, that, his memory, he was so sharp. And he was so intelligent. I mean, just, anyway, we did the show. And he says, I'm going to fly back tonight. I got a Learjet waiting for me out there. He's his buddies came down to get him. But he says, I don't want to dress here. I want to get out of here. His dressing room was full of stuff. People brought him. He kept everything. He packed everything, took it back, put it in the plane. We get out to the airport and he says, I'm not going to wear this. I'm going to change. He said, uh, let me go get my change. It's in the plane. He carried it out, brought it into the bathroom at the airport. He said, stand out here. Don't let anybody in. So I'm standing out in front of the toilet door at the airport. This guy comes away. He says, I got to go. I got to go. I says, no, you can't go in there. I got to go. Use the women. I, and I'm busted right back and went in there. I thought, oh, yeah. <laughs> So he comes out and he goes, you know something? I can't believe this, but there's a guy in there that looks just like Bob Hope. I said, really? He said, yeah. He just looks like Bob Hope. So Bob Hope came out and he said, you wouldn't believe what happened. He says, that guy accused me of looking like Bob Hope. He thought it was funny. He, he really thought it was funny that this guy thought he looked like Bob Hope. But he was just a good guy. Invited me to his house uh, down in Palm Springs, Palm Desert. Never went. Wished I had of, but I didn't. But he was he was a great one. The guy was a good guy. And we made money for Oregon State, so it was a win-win night. It was one of those gigs you do that you go, yay. It was fun. Cool. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and then there was a kid that sang on that show, too. Scotty Osborne. Scotty Alexander. He was, he had a band he was playing over in Japan. Some of my buddies were there, and they went and said, yeah, we're from Salem, Oregon. And he says, oh, you know Ed Doherty? And he says, oh, yeah, I played at the 
Bob Hope show for him and with him. And so I guess he's still out. The last I heard, he was a music director for Wayne Newton and was playing on Wayne Newton shows, too. So the kid was very talented. He was from Detroit, Oregon. Just a kid that fell out of the sky and was wonderful. But that was the Bob Hope story. That's why Bob Hope came to Salem, Oregon, because the pumpkin wanted him. <laughs> Cut. And what, what's the pumpkin's name? I remember the guy, but... DeAndros. Yeah, that, yeah, that's it. Okay. See, I'll try to find a picture of him. Pumpkin, DeAndros. I'll find a picture of him. Yeah. And using this. I yeah. guess he's passed away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that goes way back. I yeah, he was so overweight, I think his heart just exploded on uh -huh. him. Yeah. Coco. Uh, Coco, you want to do an interview? Huh? Coco, it's your turn. Here comes Sweetie. Am I in trouble yet? <laughs> Whoops, I'm in <laughs> trouble. When she's silent, I'm in trouble. Yeah. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> you want to know what to do? You want a cheeseburger? Hmm? Cheeseburger? Yeah. You want, are you hungry? Uh, it's no, I'm, I'm fine. It, it's 20 to 1. Time for your lunch or something? Uh, is it time for my lunch? Oh, it's time for my lunch. <laughs> I wonder if we could finish up real quick. Sure, uh, let's do it. Let's we do might it. Be able to. We'll be done in a half an hour. We, or less. A half an hour. Have lunch ready in a half an hour for me. Okay. Okay. And he's gone. Are you gonna stay with us and have lunch? I, I I gotta go. I'd like to. But Coco. I got, I got stuff I gotta don't do. bite him. He's a nice guy. I would. I would really. Yeah. But, um. We would. Yeah. We covered the state fair. I don't think there's a lot more to do. No. You've heard all you're gonna hear about state fair. Yeah. Stay fair is over okay. with. So, yeah, we'll get right on it and finish jam. Half an hour. I'll be ready to eat. Or Have it ready. Yeah. Woman, yeah. woman. The anniversary party. Oh, the anniversary parties were done because these things were so popular. Is it turned on? Yeah. Hold it. Let me check our time, though. Might have to put another tape in. No, we're, we got, we're good for a while. Um, the first one was the 25th anniversary I bought Paul Revere back because that was, you know, the armory was referred to as the home that Paul Revere built, the Salem Armory. So we brought him in and because uh, he actually made that thing go. And it was his worst performance he ever did because he had changed over from doing dances to doing concerts at casinos. So it only do about a minute of his hit, and then go into another minute of his hit, and then do the gun and the thing. But everybody loved him. They were here, and the people came to see him. We had like six or seven other bands to, to play. So, it was it was a good it was it went well. So we we were gonna do one. I think on the thirtieth we did it on the thirty fifth, and it went very well too. And we did one on the fortieth, and it went well too. And that was the one we did at the Oregon State Fair where, we sold five thousand tickets. And you could have dinner and you could watch all the acts. We had some pretty good acts. And a lot of the big names were there. Shirelles and, and uh, I think Limbo was there, wasn't he? And yeah, that was, a, that was a good show. There were a lot of good acts. and It was a four-hour show and I think everybody enjoyed themselves. The, again, that's why we're doing this whole thing is what happened in the 60s at the Armory? It just clicked. It gave somebody a place to go. The parents felt that their kids were safe. And we just had a good time. And then when the drug thing hit in the 70s, I went into the fair business and kind of got away from the dance business because it started getting a little dirty. Mm -hmm. When you had more drug dealers in the bathroom than kids. And we figured out a way to take care of that too. Or my, my boys did. Thank you, Kazi. <laughs> Thank you, Gilchrist. Thank you, Edwards. Thank you, John Hammer. Oh, uh, John Hammer is one of the chaperones. We never said chaper. I ran into him about a month ago and told him we were going to do a, a show, we thought. And he said, I want to be there. So they're all there. All, the, uh, all my chaperones are still around. And we'll have them there, too, if we do it. Um. Oh, oh, I wanted to, to have, I have a list of artists to talk about. Sure. So, whatever comes to mind, Merle Haggard. Great. 
Uh, say, say his name when you start talking about him. We're talking about Merle Haggard, the guy that didn't show up for me in, uh, in uh, Roseburg. He was playing a fair for me. Uh, I was doing a fair in uh, Vancouver, the Clark County Fair. And he and his wife had a riff, and he walked off the stage there and got in his bus and drove back to, to his house down there in California. He was supposed to stop the next day and do uh, Roseburg, but he didn't. He just drove on through. So we kind of had a falling out, but he did come back to Roseburg two years later and, and apologized to the town and to me and, and everybody. And, and so my feeling about him was, yeah, he was a good guy. He, he was a good guy. Johnny Cash. Everybody said he's a problem. Never had a problem with him. Always did great shows. Lou Robbins, his manager, was a great guy. Never had a problem with Johnny Cash. Well, he does this, this, and this. Never saw that. If he did those things, I never saw it. But he was he was always good. Uh, can you, you, you've told me this story before, but we haven't got it on tape before. Where he, the interviewer, the reporter, asked him a question you weren't supposed to ask and Johnny, the t-shirt in the mud puddle. Oh, we had this reporter from Portland show up to do that AM show with him at the... They did it at the fairgrounds the day of his show in the morning. And we filmed it right on the stage of the, where the show was. And uh, we had an earlier meeting, would you do it? And I had Dwight Butt come in, and so he knew that we said to him, do not bring up anything to Johnny Cash about going to jail or drugs. As far as I know, Johnny Cash never went to jail. He was uh, uh, held one time for an hour because there were some questions. But as far as I know, I never saw him drunk, use drugs. Um, I never saw him as a problem. His family was always there. June was a sweetheart. The daughter, her daughters, or they, I mean, it was just always a good, good deal. Anyway, we told him, he said, do not bring that up. Okay, I won't. Because if you are, we're not going to do it. I won't do it. So we meet at 9 o'clock in the morning for that AM show. And, and John, I had to go get Johnny. And we picked him up in the car. And he came and, and uh, took him on stage. And this interviewer said, uh, Johnny Cash, you're here tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Second question out of his mouth, how much time did you do in jail? Johnny Cash looked at me and I went, I told him not to do that. And he said, I did none. That's, that's not true. I, I didn't do any time in jail. And he kept dwelling on the drug thing and the jail thing. And, and Johnny was very, very nice about it and, and finally ended it. But before he left, this interviewer gave him a T-shirt of him, with his picture on the front of it. And Johnny just kind of held it in his hand. We put him in the car. We're driving him out Market Street to the hotel. And as we got about halfway out there, he was sitting in the front seat. The window came down, and this T-shirt went out the window. Window went back up. Lou said, "Sorry about that, Johnny." He said, "Kind of wish the guy was in the car because I'd have thrown him out after the T-shirt." And I said, "I told him not to do it." He said, "He said, I know you're young. When are you going to learn that? Don't trust the press." Don't trust, trust TV guys, radio guys. He says, they'll do anything to get their name out there. And I said, well, I got used. I'm sorry. And he said, forget it. And that was the last of it. It really torqued him off that the guy would stab him in the back that way. That was my Johnny Cash story. Dolly Parton. Great. First time I met her, she was touring with Merle Haggard. The bus pulled up and the bus door opened and she was standing in the busway. I looked at her and went, who is she? She was nobody then. She was just an opening act for Merle Haggard. But certainly found out who she was. I brought her back here to the Oregon State Fair a few years later because she was doing a, a thing for Willamette. Her boyfriend went to Willamette or something. And I was doing a, uh, a thing at Willamette that morning. And she showed up and sat in the crowd and listened to the spiel we gave on on what we do and how we do it. She, sweetheart. just absolute sweetheart uh, couldn't have been any nicer did everything he wanted to do pictures howdy howdy everything Dolly Parton is a sweetheart Ray Charles uh, 
Ray Charles was always great to me. Uh, everybody said, you never bring any blacks through. I said, well, uh, I can bring Ray Charles through. He's probably one of the biggest shows we had. He's, he was very nice, uh, didn't want to do autographs, didn't want to do pictures, but he did them. So he was, he was fussy, but he did it. Hoyt Axton? I loved Hoyt Axton. I, 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 he was fun to be with. He liked to eat. He liked to talk about eating, and he loved to travel. And you could bring him to anybody, and they loved him. Hoyt Axton was to love a... We were in Roseburg, because he was from Roseburg, some little town back in the canyon. When he left his wife, he took his ice tray. And he still had it in his bus. This is what I got out of my first marriage. But his movie was playing in Roseburg. Remember his movie? Gremlins? Yeah. And we go, we, it, it was playing in Roseburg. He says, let's go, because we were there a night early. I says, let's go. He says, but we got to buy milk duds, because I like to throw them around the movie though and he walked in there a few people recognized him a lot of people didn't recognize him but he was a hoot the guy he was a party animal the guy was a party animal i had fun with him a lot of fun with him his mother wrote blue suede shoes he said she made more off that than he made off his whole life she wrote blue suede shoes and gave it to who who's saying that I can't oh. remember yeah. Because um, I had him here in town. He was bragging about yeah. She wrote it, didn't give it to Hoyt. She gave it to uh, me. Carl Perkins? Yep. Yeah. That's right. And Carl Perkins. And uh, Johnny Cash wrote a lot of Carl Perkins stuff, too. And I don't know what happened there. There was a falling out, but mm -hmm. it wasn't pretty. Yeah. So anyway. Okay. Uh, Roy Clark? Great. Uh, gentleman, on time, musician. Uh, his crew was always polite. He was always polite. Uh, just a real gentleman. Of course, maybe because I owned the Country Western radio station in town with a bunch of guys, and we played his hits, that might have helped. Hello? Everly Brothers. Interesting people. First time I had them, buddies, 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 buddies. Last time I had them, they were fighting. So we announced them. One came in from this side of the stage. The other one came in on this side of the stage. They did their, hit, they did their shows. They both left. Don't know what they're at now. That's been years ago, but yeah, but right. they were real buddies at one time. Backstage, they weren't together. Oh, in fact, the the governor, the Goldsmith, showed up and he wanted to talk to him, and they said, "We don't want to talk to him," which really helps my spot. You know, don't you run it? Yeah, well, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> one's probably in Cucamonga by now, and the other one's probably out having a prano pup or dog or something. I, I, you know. Uh, yeah, I'll go get them for you and yeah. bring them in there, and they'll they'll end up killing one another in front of you. But yeah, Jan, Jan and Dean. Oh, good people. Jan and Dean were always good people. I I didn't get them till after the accident, but but Jan was always nice, polite. Uh, Dean was the businessman, and he was they were just good people, and had a lot of fun. And uh, I, I, I did them a lot of times because they were one of the bigger hits back way back. Okay. Yeah, good people. Two more, uh, Smothers Brothers. Oh, Tommy and those guys. Um, I put them here at the Elsinore. I had them at the fair. I put them a lot of places, and it was always a party. I, in fact, I called them up one time. We were doing Medford, and I said, uh, you know, Medford's got a lot of wines. I can call the wine people and they'll bring wines for you to do a wine tasting while you're here. They shipped two cases of wines from their winery down there to have there for people here to taste their stuff. And that was kind of cool. Yeah, you know, they, they were always fun. They, they loved to pull practical jokes. Uh, when we had them somewhere, one of the board members said, my son is really a fan of them. Can he ride in the car when we pick him up at the airport? I said, sure. Because they're fun people. So they go to the airport and they pick them up. And they pick them up, they're fighting. This is what the kid told me. He said they were fighting at the airport and they put them in the back of the van. About halfway to the fairgrounds, they were on the floor in the van back there just pounding on one another, just beating on one another. He says, I was so embarrassed I didn't even talk to them. And he said they were yelling and screaming and 
cussing and just yelling. He says, I didn't know what to do. And they get to the fairgrounds, pull the van up, door opens. They both get out, shake the hand of the driver, and they shake the hand of the kids. It's been fun, guys. They put an act on for him. And they didn't get it till after they were out of the van. So they showed up that night to get him and they started laughing at him. And those two guys just said, you really scared us, you know? And they thought, got to do something. And we weren't having any fun. That was fun to do because you guys ate it. You guys believed it. And they went, okay. And that's, they were always doing, you couldn't believe anything they said. You couldn't, whatever they told you. We were sitting in a bar one time after a show and people walked up and says, you guys look like the Smothers Brothers. They had that guy convinced that they were not the Smothers Brothers. The guy walked away and they laughed. They thought it was funny. They were always on stage. Uh, Tommy and the other one, Tommy and... Who do you think was the smartest one and the richest one? There was a smart one, and then there was the guitar, the big bass player, the one, Tommy. Which one do you think was the smartest and the richest? Tom. Tom. Yeah, yeah, he was. Tom was the smartest one and had the most money. He comes off that way. Yeah, he was. Yeah. He was. <laughs> and I'll tell you why after the camera's off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then Donny Osmond. Even. Oh, uh, Donny Osmond was a gentleman. Marie was a gentle, a, a lady. The boys were wonderful. They were just wonderful. In fact, they they played uh, Spokane. The boys did, and I was not there. But they they mentioned. They said, uh, "Yeah, we used to play Salem." And they did. They were very good. They were. They were. Uh, I got a call from that safari jungle down in Roseburg saying that we have this leopard. And we'd like to bring it up and have Marie put it in her dressing room because it's tame. I said, "No, I won't. No, I know wild animals. I know wild animals are different. They change." He brought it anyway. He got hold of Marie, and she said, "Bring it up." So that that leopard was literally in her dressing room. On the couch and it made me very nervous because wild animals are wild animals that wild animal a week later attacked a person and hurt him pretty bad so I sent it to Murray saying here's why I don't like to do that but it did it hurt hurt the person really bad uh, and it was just a fluke thing someone run by and excited it and it jumped up and attacked him Murray was always a sweetheart a gentleman she was with her first husband then he was a basketball player out of Italy or something he was kind of a jerk but she made up for it mm -hmm. that's the end of my list of is there, are there any any of the top of your off the top of your head there did you have do you want to say something about no. we talked about others before yeah too so we've done quite a few of them but I thought I'd just make sure there's and then, did you want to say anything about looking back on your career, like what it all meant to you, or do you want to not go that go there with it? No, you know, looking back the 50 years, I lot met a lot of people, had a lot of fun. I guess what really surprised me is the way some people act around entertainers. They they change. It's like they're trying to impress them or something. I'm going. Never had that problem, I guess. But they changed. And they, and they treat entertainers like they're different. They're no different. They give you that feeling sometimes, but they're not any different. A lot of them are very lonely, a lot of problems, and they're just trying to find themselves. And I, I, I say they're into, you know, they're, uh, they're me people, me, M-E money and ego and they prove that doesn't work you know if there if there was any entertainers i'd want to hang out with or be with it'd be donny osmond or paul revere paul revere and his wife are just wonderful people god they're just wonderful people fun to be with fun to in fact paul called me up and said i'm taking a ship out of florida i want you on it i got to perform on it i, I want you on it to, to be with uh me and and uh, for the week and he flew me down 
stayed in the hotel that he owns and spent a week with, with Paul. And it was a lot of fun. But I, 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 most of them, and the reason is not because I, I don't like them, it's just we have no common interest. I get tired of listening to me, 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 me. To me, a good entertainer was one that I could research and get airplay off of, record sales off of, and things that would make sell tickets. You know, I sit outside of many dance halls where I turn tickets for a buck and a buck and a quarter over a lot of years. And when someone asked me what I did, I said, well, I ran entertainment. But basically it would be tear tickets or Jan would sell tickets, I'd tear tickets. And after it's all over with and done, it was a fun way to do it. Met a lot of people, met a lot of jerks, met a lot of people who are phonies, but it was fun to do. Good, I like that. Yeah, I wanted you to do something there to end like that. Just now let me critique you. Mm -hmm. Go for it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, thank you. Maybe we won't go there. No. Yeah, that's, I think we got it all, Ed. My notes, anyway. Unless there's anything else. I'll find that, that file. It's in there somewhere. Okay.